Thank you, Dan. And thanks for inviting Dan and I to come and talk about our Iowa Source Water Protection Program. Um, first off, how many people drink water here? About everybody. So this is, you're in the right place today because we're talking about drinking water. Uh, as Dan said, we're with the Iowa Department of Natural Resources. And these are some of the things I want to cover today. Uh, overall, our source water protection program, how Iowa is building their source water protection program. We want it to be more effective and implementable for those uh, communities out there. And I also want to talk some about the funding resources that we have located over the last six years and also about the collaborative that has been built through our case studies that we're going to talk about today. Dan is going to talk to you more about the technical side of a groundwater site investigation. Those site investigations we implemented about 2007, 2008. And so those are very um, important to our source water program. I just wanted to let you know, kind of this is, if you're not liking any of these topics, you probably want to leave now. But so where does source water protection fit in? I'll be honest, 10 years ago, I really didn't know anything about source water protection. I worked in watersheds. Once in a while, somebody would call me up and say, hey, uh, I'm curious, can you help me out with source water protection? I'm like, I'm, I'm just swamped with watershed work right now. I can't really get into source water. So, uh, so it's a good question. Where does source water fit in? Because 10 years ago, I really was wondering that, and today I know where it fits in. Uh, some of you, maybe you've heard about the Charleston, West Virginia accident that occurred, left 300,000 people without drinkable water. They couldn't shower. They couldn't do anything. Um, I don't know if, if people are aware of, but there are contaminants out there that uh, everybody should kind of have an idea of where they're at and if they may be near their inlet to their major water supply. So uh, there's a Wall Street Journal article on this, and I won't take up the time to go into it today, but if you have time, Google it. It's an interesting article, and it all relates back to source water protection. Emergency response plans, that is a part of our source water protection. Our plan, our overall plan, we make sure that a community includes an emergency response plan. If for some reason they have to go without water, what, maybe it's just that they had a water main break, which there were a lot of this year with the deep freeze, but also if uh, their nitrates exceed a certain limit or they have some other contaminant, they have to find another water supply, whether it's bottled water from Hy-Vee or whatever close by Walmart. That's what communities need to do. Oops. So, another reason that we talk about source water protection, or the main reason, is because of health reasons. Community leaders, they have to think about source water protection because of economics, along with the health risks, and sustainability. I have more communities concerned today about where am I going to get water for my community 50 years from now? After the drought of the last two years, they're thinking, where am I going to get water next year? So sustainability is very important to our communities. When we talk about our source water protection program today, you're going to hear a lot about nitrates, but I don't want to leave out that we also address other contaminants, whether it's petroleum products of some sort or um, solvents from dry cleaners, uh, above ground storage tanks. There are other contaminants w that we address in our source water protection program, but with the limited time, we will only be addressing mainly our nitrate issues. Talking about nitrates, everyone I hope knows about the MCL. This is legally regulatory. Uh, 10 milligrams per liter is the allowable nitrate level in drinking water. And it mainly goes back to a health risk for blue baby syndrome. The health risks are also somewhat tied to other problems. Um, some of them are uns unsubstantiated, so I won't go into those. But um, for sure we know it causes blue baby syndrome. If you exceed that MCL, it has the risk of causing that. Uh, when we talk about nitrates in our public water supplies, it, it's 
really the dep it's dependent mainly on the amount of nitrate that's applied to the land and also on the susceptibility of, of that water supply. Common sources of nitrates, I think most people understand where our non-point source nitrates come from, but mainly all of our nitrates that we find in our, in our uh, case studies are non-point source type things. So fertilizer applied on the ground in areas in our capture zone areas. Oops, sorry. So you're probably wondering what are you going to do about all those types of things uh, with high nitrates. If it's non-point source, we have a suite of practices. We like to be able to have a list of those practices to produce to those landowners out there because what works for one landowner doesn't always work for the other. Uh, we like to also prioritize. We don't do random acts of conservation anymore. Uh, 20 years ago, I worked in watersheds, and that was before we had the technology that we do today. And anybody in a 20,000-acre watershed, we would sign them up for a, for a conservation practice. Today, it's much more specific, even in our watershed work. With GIS mapping, you can tell where the heavy sediment loads are coming from in a watershed. And kind of through our case, which Dan Cook will go over today, the groundwater site investigations and our case studies, we don't do so much random uh, conservation anymore. We look at the exact area of where those contaminants are coming from. I also just wanted to point this slide out quick. I won't spend time on it. Uh, something that I found recently was nitrates are not a concern just in Iowa. As you can tell from this map, Nebraska is also highly susceptible. So. There are high risk of nitrates in many areas of the, of the country. I want to go into kind of a little bit of the history of the Iowa Source Water Protection Program. When I came into this program, I tried to li locate the 250-some plans that we currently had. Um, it was an outside consultant that had written those over about a 10-year period. And uh, looking at those, they had no implementation strategy. So. I had the great opportunity of trying to come up with a new way of doing our plan so that we had something that was implementable. Communities, the other reason to get uh, <laughs> a new swing on how we did our plans was that we needed the buy-in of the communities. These are all voluntary programs with source water protection. Any project that comes in, it's voluntary. Um, we try to get these communities to understand that right off the bat and that they need to write us a letter of request asking for our assistance. I don't go out there banging on doors. We do have a list of those susceptible communities in Iowa, and those are the ones we will address once they send us a letter of request. I just kind of wrote out some of the, the steps that we've done to reform the source water protection program. As I mentioned earlier, we have the highly susceptible community water supplies list, the 262. We started to look at focusing our limited resources, and we then went on to initiating a formal process. And we wanted to do that from the grassroots up, because I haven't seen a lot of success from the top down. And we also want to start building that collaborative So first off, I was highly susceptible community water supplies. How did we identify those? We found, uh, we went through our databases and we identified all the community water supplies that had five milligrams per liter or above in finished water. We also looked for those that had shallow alluvial wells or karst. And as I said earlier, we have 262 out of the 880 public water supplies that are on our list. So. Number two, when we focus our limited resources. In order to do that, I felt that we really needed to split the program from the high-risk communities to the not-at-risk communities and focus our main resources on those at-risk communities. As a result of doing that, we've got a nationally recognized source water protection project at RIMS in Iowa that, that uh, has been extremely successful all the way around. It's kind of my poster child for source water protection. Um, the planning process includes a lot more partners than it ever did in the past. Research studies are helping in other communities. Everything that we learn at one community, we do carry that throughout all the other communities. 
And along with these case studies, I've identified a lot more of these resources that were never existent before. The Watershed Improvement Review Board grant, source water had never been funded by WERB before, and they had never utilized WERB money to purchase land and convert that land. So there was a lot of strides that have been made in the uh, source water program just in partnering up and finding additional resources. So we also wanted to kind of get a formal source water protection process down. These are kind of the steps. I'm not going to go spend a lot of time on them, but um, just wanted you to know that being from DNR, I didn't want to be knocking on their door. I want those communities to see that this is uh, something that they want and that they need to request it from us. The source water planning team, I request that we always have NRCS sitting at the table the SWCD or the Department of Ag, someone from that local office that works in conservation because usually they will be our go-to for what programs are available and also assist us with our, uh, with our uh, technical implementation part of it. Um, basically, if we don't have the local folks on board, they're the ones that have to implement this in the end, but we provide the technical assistance as far as the groundwater site investigation, identifying their resources, bringing together the right partners so that we can have a successful plan in the end. The collaborative, as you'll see in this picture, we've got uh, a group from the Sioux Center project, which included uh, Dort College, the city, NRCS, Pheasants Forever, a number of of partners there and all of these even the uh, on the on the right there you'll see the tractor that was the pheasants forever in rims in Iowa they paid for fifteen thousand dollars worth of seed they did the seed bed preparation and they also have a long-term agreement with the city to continue the maintenance of that area so at the local level this is the list of of our uh, partners source water Collaborative is kind of a word that I've gotten from EPA and, and out east is to use the collaborative word, but I've always called them, these are just our partners that we work with all the time. And we have our state partners. Um, we utilize everything. Everybody's working together, and our main focus is the resource. How can we protect the resource? And we, our resource is protecting the drinking water for these community water supplies. So in order to pull all this together, over time, we did these case studies, and I'm going to focus on RIMS in Iowa today. Dan's going to show you kind of the groundwater site investigations that he conducted at RIMS and Elliott and Griswold. I have 12 communities that we've conducted groundwater site investigations on. I'm just focusing on these three out of the 12 for now. When I first was invited to come to RIMS, and the big scare that they had was that they were getting dangerously close to the 10 milligrams per liter. They hired a consulting engineer. The engineer had said, this is what it's going to cost you to put in an RO system. 1.8 million just to install it. The 35,000, at least 35,000 a year for operating and maintenance. And then you probably have to upgrade your water operator if you're putting in an RO system. So that kind of got them motivated, maybe a little bit quicker than, than usual, but they had they contacted me in 2007, and that's when we just initiated this program of groundwater site investigations. So when I went to that community, I asked that they first make sure that we have all the landowners in the capture zone on our source water planning team, as well as Pheasants Forever, NRCS, the city, the water operator. Those were the key people that we needed on board before we ever got going with this site investigation. The next thing we needed was that we take water samples from each individual well because we didn't know if their high nitrates were all their wells were high or if it was just one that was high that was making their finished water higher. So we started that right off the bat too with um, sampling five of their shallow wells. The other thing that the source water planning team did was provide Dan Cook the information, the local knowledge what is being applied on the fields in this capture zone area, 
how much. We even had a landowner or farmer bring in the analysis from the manure that was being applied so that we had a better idea of maybe what, what even further, not just the pounds of manure per acre that's being applied, but what that analysis showed. So everybody's very cooperative, and I think it was good to have them on board from the get-go instead of calling them in at the end of it and asking them to do uh, implementation. So once we conducted the uh, source water protection, or the source water, the groundwater site investigation, then we provide the results of that to the source water planning team. Now, when Dan gets done completing his groundwater site investigation, we also have a technical assessment team that's made up of two engineers, a hydrogeologist, an agronomist, and a physicist to review those results and so that everybody's in consensus on what those results show. So that when we go to that community, um, it's not just Dan saying this is what it is. We have a group of, of uh, folks agreeing on what the outcomes were. So for those of you that um, maybe not be familiar with non-point source, these are just a couple examples. And then the point sources. So in Remsen, their action plan starts out with identifying what is the primary source of the contaminant. And it was identified as a non-point source. Localized non-point source is what we call it of nitrates. And then we let the the local team develop what are the practices that they want to install. In that particular case study in Remsen, they decided it would be best to purchase, it was about 20 acres, purchase that land, convert it from um, farmland that had over application of commercial fertilizer and over application of manure to native grasses. And they utilized SRF funding for an additional about 40 acres that they bought that happened to come up for sale at the same time, but it was adjacent to their well field. So down gradient of their well field, they purchased land. Up gradient, they utilized a WERB grant to purchase that land. And then in that action plan, they also identified who's going to what, when, and where. And that was where the local Pheasants Forever chapter said, we will seed, we will seed that land, we will take care of it, we'll maintain it, who's in charge, NRCS, would also sign up anybody that was interested in CRP, wellhead protection, which they did. They had a, uh, actually a soil and water conservation commissioner that realized he had land in a capture zone area and he signed up his land. So that was, it, a lot of it is information education. I think people want to do the right thing. It's just, they just aren't aware of, of any impacts that they have. And so once they are aware of it, those landowners were willing to make changes. Um, any ad additional or in-kind resources, once, once we got everything implemented, there are things that came up, like the maintenance, who's going to do the burns of the native grasses. The fire department came, came in and said that they would help with that, Pheasants Forever, NRCS. So they had a good group, a good support group for maintaining this land once it was converted from cropland to native grass. And then evaluate results. As I said earlier, when we started this project, we were monitoring all the individual wells, and we are still monitoring all the individual wells. Oops. Oh, it's not advancing. There. I wanted to point out, too, is that uh, when Iowa had RCNDs, it used to be NRCS would, would fund an RCND coordinator. And uh, we are fortunate that um, the Sioux Rivers RCND assisted in writing the grant for the WERB grant. Sometimes that can be a real problem for a community is who's going to write those grants. I can assist in writing it, but I cannot write the entire grant for them. Um, just wanted to point out that there are a lot of partners in the Remsen project, and that's part of that source water collaborative. If you don't have those partners, it's really hard to implement something without the resources. And this is the land, just a, a shot, and Dan's going to get into this a little bit more, so I won't spend time on that. Um, we also had the junior chapter of the Pheasants Forever that helped out with this, and so that was 
That was really beneficial because as we all age, we know that there's a new generation that's got to pick up the slack where we're going to leave off. And so it's good to have that junior chapter person that remembers being out there and, and assisting. And so 20 years from now, hopefully he's still helping to protect that drinking water supply. I wanted to also kind of show the cost to benefit ratio. In my program, I budget about 17000 per groundwater site investigation and for time spent on each one of these projects. And as you can see in the rims and example, um, we spent about 17,000, but then when I look at what we gained back from that or what the city gained, they got the, the WERB grant. And I don't believe they would have gotten the WERB grant if we had not had that groundwater site investigation report, if we wouldn't have had the baseline data and shown how we're going to measure improvements over time with that um, individual monitoring of the wells. So the word board, a lot of them um, I worked with when I worked in watersheds and to talk to them about, because um, I wanted to duplicate this in other projects, what is it that, that made you fund this project? And it was those main things. You could show your improvements over time and you could show where exactly that problem was originating at and what you were going to do about it. As I said earlier, they applied for an SRF loan they got a 0% interest loan because they had a source water protection plan. Um, and again, Pheasants Forever came through with funding for the seeding costs. The main thing I wanted to really focus in on is the reductions. The five shallow alluvial wells at Rimson, there was one well that is at 27 milligrams per liter when we started. And as of this last year, they were down to 13. It steadily stair stepped down. So it wasn't a spike up and down. It steadily came down over the five years and was down to 13 this last year. So um, that's pretty remarkable. But then overall in their finished water, um, we, had, we saw a reduction of two milligrams per liter, which if you're at a community that's at eight and you can drop it down to six, it kind of takes, takes the pressure off. If you're at 10 and it drops it down to 8, you're not, you're not still as under the gun, but you're still kind of under the gun. But I think for this community, they were relieved that they didn't spend $1.8 million as originally directed to. Um, they went towards a more sustainable uh, practice rather than a treatment, a prevention rather than a treatment. Elliott is another project. Um, Elliott's a small town, and I don't think I mentioned, Remsen's a town of about 1,600 people. I focus on communities of 10,000 or less. I figure that our program should be trying to help these communities that are so small that they really don't have the resources to do this kind of work. Larger communities like Des Moines, yes, they, they have a little bit more resources than a community of 350 people. So we're hoping that our work here can help other communities. So on Elliott, when they came to me and said, we have a nitrate problem, we know we have a nitrate problem, can you help us? Um, they were already pretty high in their nitrates. So we still went in, we conducted a groundwater site investigation. Um, this remarkable community for 350 people, they had, 200, they had 22 members on their source water planning team. And through the, it takes about two to three years to really do a plan from start to finish to implementation. So in that time, we wanted to examine all their options. They could put in ion exchange, but did the wastewater treatment system allow for that uh, waste coming from that? That was going to be a cost. Um, if they did an RO, that was way out of the ballpark for costs. And then if they went to rural water, they couldn't do that because rural water wasn't close enough and they would not hook them up or come that far. So that wasn't an option. If they drilled a new well, it was no guarantee that nitrates wouldn't be in that well as, um, just the same. So they did look at all options and they looked at all the cost and uh, came up with installing the wetland. And uh, the wetland was just installed in 2013. And for them, it wasn't just a wetland it, to denitrify. It became something much more, it kind of built that community. Um, the wetland is actually located right outside of their elementary school. It became an outdoor classroom area. They applied for a REAP grant of 50000 They received 
funding from so many different sources just to install this wetland. Um, they have walking trails, ADA walk, walking trails. Um, I do have a fact sheet that's available on this site as well if you're interested in the, the details. But what I really wanted to stress is it doesn't really matter how big a community you are. You can still make an impact uh, and you can go far beyond just doing nitrate reduction. You can look at a quality of life for that community. This is the list of the partners and I'll just say a few things here. You would never guess that a neighboring town would want to help out but they did. They donated a bridge to put over the wetland so that the kids could get around and, and uh, the walking path could be completed. Griswold Schools donated land. Uh, it was kind of a, new, a unique system where they uh, donated about five acres out the back towards this, this effort of the wetland. Landowner, he actually sold his land, which when land is, you know, corn is $7 a bushel, you're just not going to find too many landowners right now that are willing to sell, but he did, and it was a, it was a fair price. Um, the Golden Hills RCND again, another RCND. They they helped write a grant. They got the a number of grants for this community. Um, the National Park Service they helped with the uh, the walking trails and a number of other things at that site, and the soil, uh, soil and water conservation districts. Two districts came forward with money, about 20000 so that was very helpful. Um, just a number. I you have a list here, but everybody came forth either in technical assistance or in actual dollars. So in the end, uh, you have all the kids out there ready to go out and do their out outdoor classroom. Aerial view of the, the installed wetland there. So what we want to do is kind of continue duplicating these case studies in other sites. Um, our main thing is when we go to a community, we ask, is it a point source or a non-point source that's causing your nitrate problem? If it's both, then we need to write a plan for both. If it's only one, then let's write the plan for just a non-point source. But we really don't want to go out and ask landowners to change their land use what they're doing, what they're planting, if it turns out it was a, a spill from an ag chem facility just up the road. We also want to determine, better determine the capture zone area so that we know where those, those, uh, where the water is coming from for that public water supply. Griswold, this is the last case study. Um, this has been a, somewhat of, a, I'll admit, it was a little bit of a challenging community they had a hard time making a decision. The landowners said they'd like to do cover crops, but that might cost them, and they were a little bit afraid of what the cost would be, and that's justifiable. Um, we asked the Practical Farmers of Iowa and Iowa State to come in and, and provide information on cover crops so that we could get the best um, seeding for them, something that would work for the farmer as well as for the city. The city actually had bought seed in June and hired a pilot to fly that on the 1st of September. So the city was very proactive in purchasing the seed and asking the landowners to come in and show where they would apply that on what acres. There's about 630 acres in this capture zone area. Um, the next thing we did was write a grant for the Conservation Innovation Grant that USDA and NRCS offered. And what we wanted to show is that through cover crops, how much of a reduction we would see in their public water supply if we could get up to 75% of that 630 acres installed in cover crops. So it's a three-year grant. Um, had Dan and another one of our staff people go out and put in two monitoring, four monitoring wells so that we could sooner see that impact from the cover crops over the next three years. This is the seeding that we saw um, in October. They seeded it the 1st of September. And they already had about six inches of uh, rye on top of the ground by early October. So the farmers are pretty happy. And as you'll see in our uh, video that we're showing at the end of this segment, is that um, that's mainly showing the farmers and what their their suggestions were what, why they ever signed up for source water protection, why they're doing cover crops. So if you can stick around and see that video at the end, I think that kind of ties together all of our case studies and what we're trying to do in source water protection in Iowa. 
So in conclusion, I think we really need to look at what the concerns of the citizens are, not just what the city water operators, um, citizens within that community, but also those landowners, what their concerns are. It helps them to understand basically what needs to be done. And I think once they understand what, what can be done to decrease nitrates, they'll be more willing to implement and do their part. Source water protection needs a lot of partners. As you saw at the Elliott and NRCS and Griswold, it took a lot of partners. It's just not one or two agencies coming together to make something happen. It's a number of agencies, a number of, of groups and people that really care. And as soon as they understand what the needs are, I think that they come forward and, and produce resources. One of the biggest things that I think is helpful in these case studies is that we had an, a credible groundwater site investigation conducted. And people don't jump on board unless they, they believe in the people that are doing the groundwater site investigation. So I think that's really uh, imperative that we have a groundwater site investigation of these highly susceptible community water supplies. So as long as we have all the adequate planning, investigations, resources available, and buy-in that's needed by the, by the community and the landowners, I think we'll have uh, less problems with source water protection in the future. So with that, um, I'm going to let Dan Cook come up and talk to you about his groundwater site investigations, and then we'll wrap it up with the 10-minute video. I'm Dan Cook, as it says, and uh, Becky uses my section, contaminated sites section, to help um, with the investigation, as she mentioned to you. We have the, the, the staff, the technology, the equipment to go out and do groundwater investigations. Normally, we're working at contaminated sites across the state, but this gives us an opportunity to go out and, uh, I guess, play scientist for a couple days as we do the work for her. So, um, for my portion of the projects that I do for her, the the main goals that I have are to identify the groundwater flow paths. We have to know where the groundwater is coming from so we can help determine um, you know, where, the, where the nitrate in, the, in these cases are coming from. Um, identify the potential, potential source areas, non-point point source as you mentioned, and um, site-specific conditions within the geology that might help determine uh, um, practices at the end of the day to, to solve the problem. So the first site, Remsen, and so this is the work that I started with the site, you know, identifying where the shallow wells are. They also have deep wells that go down to the, the Cretaceous, to the um, Dakota Sandstone. But uh, for this investigation, we just focused on the shallow wells, and you can see uh, um, well number eight is the, the well of concern. The other wells had nitrate, elevated nitrate levels in them, but not near what well number eight had. So it's kind of a unique feature in, at the site. So first of all, I used uh, 3D mod flow to create a model of the well field. And um, this is all wells turned off. The, I don't know if you can see, yeah, you can see the red lines going through here. Those are, uh, you know, um, I had a little bit of knowledge of the site before I created the, the model. And we had an indication that uh, the farmer in this area here might be applying too much nitrate or too much manure to the fields. So I added um, sources to that field and then a uh, small cattle confinement area. I included that as a source area. So the, you also in, in import um, known conditions about the aquifer, about the sand and gravel, the, how thick it is, the groundwater flow through that, you know, doing conductivity testing and stuff. And, and then these are the three wells of interest, well number eight, well number three, and well number five. With all wells turned off, this is what the model predicted the, the nutrients would do as they move through the, the aquifer. And if I can get it to advance. Yeah. There it goes. Okay, and this is the steady state for all the wells turned on. So it shows well number eight capturing the majority of the contaminant that was coming from that field. And then 
if you turn um, well number eight off, you can see that the contaminants would move to well number three and well number five. So we went out and did some field work to try to proof my data. And this is a picture of our geoprobe. It's a hydraulic drilling rig. It just pushes, uses hydraulic force, a real fancy jackhammer to push the rods down into the ground. We have 120 feet, drill, 120 feet of drill string, so it, it's quite effective for what we need to do. This is a typical view of the, the aquifer. Uh, there's about 10 to 15 feet of, of sandy loam, and then uh, coarse gravel and sand down to about 30 feet where it runs into a real tight blue clay. And the, um, the nine wells in the center are the ones that I did specifically for well number eight. But I did background surface water, um, midstream surface water, and, and down gradient surface water, and you know, around four parts per million for nitrate. Up gradient groundwater, um, non detect above the, the feedlot, but you know, pretty good levels of nitrates just below the feedlot, 30 at the, shall the shallow water, and 11 down below. Um, this is probably the direction the groundwater flow through here, so it's not too bad of levels here and then here also. Um, so I, I'm not seeing the high level of nitrate in the background that would uh, explain why I'm getting 27 parts per million in well number eight. Um, so now the, the numbers around the well number eight, those are, these are those nine wells. And you can see I had a, as high as 20, you know, 23, 24 parts per million in my groundwater samples. But you go just downstream of well number eight and I was already falling below the MCL. Um, so the superimposed that, this is a shallow water, so superimposed that image onto the map. You can see that uh, there's a lot of water coming, or lo what looks like a lot of impacted water coming from that field, because we know upgrading to that field, the groundwater was clean. And again, this is the deep water showing the same thing, where there's a lot of, of impacted water. Um, so it kind of proved my model that that well number eight is acting as a, as a kind of like a guard well. As long as well number eight is pumping, it protects well number three and well number five from the high nitrate levels. And so I went out to that, that triangle shaped cornfield um, and took some samples and found um, nitrate in the soil. You know, starting as, you know, from 400 parts per, per um, 400 parts per million of nitrate, or 400 pounds per acre per foot, all the way up to 650 pounds per acre per foot. And that's at the zero to one foot column and the one to two foot column. So a tremendous amount of a nutrient in that zero to two foot column, um, way, mu way too much um, even for what corn would need for the year. So what we found for the site was that um, this triangular shaped field was getting way too much nutrient applied to it throughout the year. The farmer was, was just using it to dump manure on it just to get rid of it. And um, the, the other farmer that was, was using it um, was also applying commercial fertilizer to it. So no one was doing testing to see how much nutrient was in that field. Um, the feedlot is, is contributing some and then the city was leasing the land directly around their whale field for agricultural purposes. But the, the main part of it was what was happening in this farmer's field. And this is the slide that Becky showed, that the city took control of that property, and then they also purchased property down gradient for a further well development. And then Pheasants Forever came in and took the entire site and converted it to prairie grass and created a wellhead protection area. And this is the nitrate level that Becky was talking about. Um, as high as 27 parts per million in well number eight. And uh, the last two samples were actually down 11 parts per million. So it's uh, over the, um, the time period since the farmer stopped applying nutrients to that field. And we see, we've seen the great decrease in, in nitrate levels in that, fi in that well. And the next one is Elliott, Iowa. This is the one that used the marsh. And the reason we came up with the marsh, um, this is the, the main city well. Um, it's it's um, a hybrid well. It's half of it is in the sand and gravel above the well, above the Dakota sandstone, 
and the other half is buried into the Dakota sandstone. So it's 20 foot of screen, 10 foot in sand and gravel, and 10 foot in the, in the sandstone. Initially, this site was investigated as a Superfund site um, in an enforcement action because we were assuming the nitrate was coming from these two egg chem dealers. They were down gradient, but when you, draw, when you pump a well real heavy, you can draw water backwards um, because of the Kona depression. So these are those two egg chem dealers in, you know, in pretty bad shape. So it's kind of logical that they were, they were, they were potential source areas. <coughs> so we analyzed the, the nutrients in the groundwater and we found the high nitrate levels that, we're, that we, uh, we knew or we thought were there, but we couldn't make the connection. The city well is, this is the water tower and this is the well house. So we couldn't make the connection between the two. But surprisingly, I found uh, the background nitrate level was higher than, you know, I figured it'd be next to zero, but it was fairly high. So the site was brought into Becky's program. We used her resources to do a more widespread study at the site. And we found two unique regions of groundwater. On the northwest side of town, we found high nitrate levels. And on the southeast side of town, we found low nitrate levels. And then when I, when I pumped my water samples out, I also noticed what the, the sediments in my groundwater samples looked like. And I found um, unoxidized sands in, in the northeast, northwest side and then oxidized sands in the southeast side. And typically, nitrate will be higher in, in clean sands because that usually means there's more oxygen. Nitrate doesn't break down in an oxygen-rich environment. Um, and then vice versa. It, conversely, it does break down in these areas where you do have um, low oxygen levels, but I wasn't finding, I was finding the opposite. So I had to go out a little bit further to find out what was going on. And to the northeast of town, there is an existing marsh that's you know, been there um, since the previous glacier per glacial period. And uh, we knew the groundwater flow from other investigations in town and plus, it's a typical groundwater flow associated with uh, alluvial systems um, that the, the clean groundwater was associated with the existing marsh. So we did some more sampling, upgrading into the marsh areas, and we found elevated nitrate levels, but we were finding clean nitrate levels below the marsh. And then we had to prove that the marsh was actually doing the work, so we went out on a cold winter's day when the marsh was frozen and we collected these samples from the, from the marsh area. And we found, well, this is the work that I was doing out in the field. And uh, we found um, the parameters that would prove that nit denitrification was occurring. We found the low carbon levels, um, the low oxygen levels, and then the extremely low nitrate levels. So uh, we had the information to show that as the groundwater moved underneath the marsh, it was being denitrified. So the, um, one of the, the proposals that was made to the source water protection team was to reestablish the marsh. This used to be a marsh years ago, but reestablish the marsh and hope that that would um, uh, repeat or, or duplicate the conditions to the east of town. So that's the property that Becky was speaking of where the school donated property, the landowner sold property. And uh, this is what it looked like prior to the excavation. This was about a year ago, and uh, then this was in June of 2013, and um, then later in the summer. And then this is an aerial photo. This is not the exact same one that Becky had. It's from the 180 degrees. But you can see where the, the existing marsh used to be years ago. So the, the area at one time was busted. The, the marsh was busted, and but the the marsh will be a little bit bigger than this when it when they when they get all the work done they'll put some some uh, stop grades in that to, to raise the level a little bit um, and this is one of the signs that the National Park Service is constructing for the site <coughs> and it explains uh, what what's happening um, you know it's common knowledge that a marsh will uh, clean up surface water um, but we're finding throughout with studies throughout the country that that a marsh or wetland will also help with groundwater. And so this will be a, a plate that's up near where the education center will be that 
so that um, the students and anyone else can understand the primary purpose of this marsh. Um, Griswold, Iowa, in southwest Iowa, and um, again, it's high nitrate in, in a shallow, uh, but these, these are actually at Bedrock Wells or Dakota, but there's no aquitar, there's no protection from the sands and gravels in the Dakota, so they're actually um, treated as a shallow well. Um, the initial thought was Boffman, Boffman Creek was creating, um, you know, as, as the numbers here, you can see that Boffman Creek is highly impacted with, with nitrate in the surface water. This is the city's well field. And uh, initially we thought the hypothesis was that the groundwater was coming from Boffman Creek, creating the high levels of nitrate in the city wells. Um, so um, this is a typical uh, image of what we found, um, highly nitrate, or l waters with high nitrate levels with a lot of plant growth, a kind of an indication that it's impacted. And th this stream here was so highly impacted with ammonia that the plant growth, I mean, plants couldn't grow in it. And uh, there was little methane bubbles coming up through the mud. Now we installed our test wells. We were going to do a, we did a pump test at this site. Um, we picked our test well locations so that when we pump, this well went on the full production for the city. Um, these two wells, four and three, were taken offline and uh, they were left offline for a week to allow the, the groundwater in this area to stabilize. Um, and then we took groundwater samples in the test wells that I put in. These are probably an average of 50 feet deep. Um, we put them all at the surface of the Dakota sandstone and, and the Dakota is the source for these three wells, and so we wanted to see how far out the impact would be. If we pump these wells hard for 24 hours, how far would they reach out to grab groundwater? And so a, a pump test is, you know, you, you turn on the pump for that well and you pump it hard for a period of time and it stresses the aquifer. And... Um, we use test wells to determine how much of a stress the aquifer gets, and then we can use that information to describe to better describe the aquifer. And this is some of the equipment we used. These are just little uh, transducers that we hang down into the water in, inside our wells, and these measure to a thousandth of a foot of a drop, and uh, um, they're all all of them are synchronized before we put them down, and we had these set the the click to measure every second. And this is um, well number two. This was the one that was closest to our test well, or to the production wells. And this one I thought it would go dry because we, we didn't have much water on top of the Dakota sandstone. Um, but it ended up it had you know, just about a foot of drop. So this was a surprise to see such little drop in the well that I thought would, I would see the most drop in. And then um, well number three had a six foot drop of water. And I figured that that would... You know, again, that was a surprise. I didn't think it would be that much. Um, well, number four, I thought would be the one that was the biggest drop, and it only had about six inches of drop. So when we uh, sat down and analyzed the data, um, what we found out was, um, well, first of all, the two, the two wells that were over by Boffman Creek, my two test wells, they didn't have hardly any drop at all in them. And it took six hours for the water, for the Kona Depression to reach it. So it kind of took Boffman Creek out of the picture because it was taking too long to get to that water. And what I found out, um, you see this is that map here that shows my two test wells over by the stream. Um, well number three, two right between my pumping well, the, the pumping wells, and then well number one. So this is a cross-section of A to A prime going this way. And so you can see that the top layer of Olus, um, the first layer of sandstone um, with some shale in it, and then clean sandstone. And then when I put my test well in at the creek number three, I found out that there was a, an old wash in there from uh, you know, who knows how long ago, prior to the last glacial period. And... Uh, it filled up with sand and gravel. And it turned out that that was acting as a reservoir 
for wells number three and number four. And so that's why the water wasn't reaching out to Boffman Creek. So it turned out that my source area for the groundwater was this little creek right here in front of the wells and not the big creek a little bit higher. And this is just, a, just another angle. This is B prime, so it's going crosswise. And you can see my test well, too, right in between these two wells had hardly dro any drop at all in it. It just dropped a less than a foot. So this first layer of sandstone is not pure sandstone, so it's acting like an aquitard, and it's not letting that water drop through it. So again, it's indicating that, you know, it's just more proof that this is the groundwater flow path here into the sand and gravel channel just to the north of the site. So instead of having 6,000 acres of land that needs some type of, of I guess, um, a new practice or different practice to prevent nitrate from getting into the stream, we narrowed it down to 600 acres. So it was, a, 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 I guess, a lot easier, I guess, project to manage with 600 acres instead of 6,000 acres. Oops. And then the solution then was to, as Becky mentioned, apply cover crops to the site. So, <coughs> and that's all I have. So we, it's about seven minutes left. Um, did you want to ask questions first and then do the video for the people that have to leave or? I'm uh, interested in the section you were talking about at the state. You obviously have your own uh, groundwater research equipment and so forth. What, what is the focus of that section? What is your mandate and your, what is the funding you have? Um. The mandate for the contaminated site section is to uh, assess potential contaminated sites across the state. Um, if someone calls us at a municip municipal water supply and says, I found benzene in my water supply, we would go track that down using our, our groundwater equipment, our mobile lab, and then um, a lot of times we can track it right to someone's doorstep and then make them take over the investigation. So the main purpose is to, uh, is to keep or is to monitor the groundwater conditions of the state. For Becky's program, we just happen to have all the equipment and technology that she needs, and so she kind of like contracts with us to go do her projects for her. My question <coughs> is for Rebecca. Uh, how do you form the source water protection teams? Is it just like anyone who wants to be on the team, or do you try to recruit uh, certain uh, people within the community? For that question. Um, basically, when I go into a community, I tell the city that this is their project, and if we're going to initiate it, they need to have NRCS, which I usually contact NRCS, and then I ask the city to get all the landowners who are in the capture zone area on that team as well, and then anybody else that's within the city council, Iowa State Extension, anybody else that they would like on there, but what I require is that we have the landowners at the table and also NRCS. Does that answer that? Uh, currently, which programs are you guys promoting the most for um, projects concerning uh, point source pollution from tiling projects and stuff that you were talking about coming out and then you are talking about the um, methane seeps that were associated with that also? For point sources? Yeah, like I mean, uh, if, if 
for addressing those problems. Okay. Kind of, kind of what what are you guys doing to try and manage, uh, you know, the nitrates that are that are concentrated in those areas? Okay. For uh, when I do work for Becky's program, I'm act, I'm acting as a voluntary, non-regulatory type of person. But when I find the point source, I have to switch hats, and we let the the city know up front that, you know, I am a regulator, and if we find a point source. It comes out of Becky's program and it goes into my program, and it, a lot of cities will say, "Well, just let's just forget that we ever found it." But once I know that it's there, I I really can't. And uh, but um, we don't go in with a, a sledgehammer and start beating doors down and stuff. Though it's it, we found that it's much better to work as a partner with these the, the we call them responsible parties for the source. So a point source com comes back into my program. Um, Non-point sources will stay in Becky's program. Okay. And point sources get high priority. So. I had a question about funding from, uh, from different uh, uh, towns that can't afford um, to re-establish um, and re-configure uh, their uh, crippling infrastructure. Um, is there a way that, or a program that you guys um, provide to uh, help those communities out that can't um, uh, improve their infrastructure on their own um, that result in non-point uh, pollution sources or something like that? Uh. I think your question was to how do we address communities that are having problems with infrastructure like as far as their pipes and wastewater treatment and that type of thing those go to water supply engineering and those communities can access certain loans sometimes grants through um, SRF and that's about as much as I get involved in the infrastructure part of it if it's for that specific thing, if it's for drilling a new well, again, it goes towards that. My program's just going to deal with protecting the area, the capture zone area. Does that answer that question? Okay, I think we'll stop the questions there. Um, uh, Becky brought a couple of videos that I think are about the, the source water protection program in Iowa. Before we start that, um, I'd just like to give them a round of applause for a very well done presentation. In 2013, Iowa recorded its wettest April in 141 years. Nitrogen not absorbed by crops the previous year meandered its way into local waterways and streams as runoff. And the two rivers that supply water to Des Moines, the state's largest city, contain record levels of nitrates. By law, the Environmental Protection Agency requires that drinking water contains no more than 10 milligrams of nitrates per liter. But the Raccoon River tested at 24 milligrams per liter last spring, while the Des Moines River contained 18. And the person responsible for maintaining safe drinking water for half a million central Iowans points the finger directly at agriculture as the source of the problem. There are urban contributors to uh, runoff and to pollution. I don't mean to disparage that, but the idea that feeding the world is somehow this uh, password that lets us get by any responsibility for poisoning our neighbors is a real problem for me. In response to the record level of nitrates, the Des Moines Water Works switched on its $3.7 million nitrate removal facility for the first time since 2007. The system, which is believed to be the largest in the world, costs $7,000 a day to run, and the bill for the nearly three months of operation amounted to over half a million dollars. Operating and maintenance, that's very costly when you start putting in treatment systems. A lot of communities will look at drilling a new well, but that's not a guarantee if they drill a new well that it's not going to be drawing a contaminant such as nitrates into that new well. So Becky Ortman is the Source Water Protection Coordinator for Iowa's Department of Natural Resources. 
According to Ortman, 30% of Iowa's 880 municipal water supplies are highly susceptible to contamination from nitrates. Many of those municipalities serve small communities where an expensive nitrate removal system would be unfeasible. Most communities that are proactive will say, I want to take care of this before they reach the uh, maximum load that they're allowed to. EPA designates you can have a uh, 10 MCL is what the nitrate level is. And so once they hit that, then they have to find alternate sources of drinking water for their community. It's kind of like planting the tree. The best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The second best time is today. Over 70% of Iowa's drinking water comes from groundwater, which is tapped by drilling wells. Because it is subsurface does not mean it is pollution free. They regulate how much you have to test according to where your levels are. So since we're at an eight average, we test um, every month we send a sample in that gets reported to the DNR. We at Griswold, we test it ourselves every day um, just for our knowledge. We're not required to do that, but we test every day. Perilously close to test numbers that would cap its wells, the town of Griswold turned to the Iowa DNR to explore possible solutions. With a population of only around 1,000, less expensive solutions aimed at preventing contaminated water rather than treating it were explored. Our primary objective when we go into a community that has an existing contaminant problem is to identify if that contaminant is a point source or a non-point source, and then to try to better define the capture zone area of where their drinking water is coming from. The capture zone is the area where a well draws its water. Once the capture zone is identified, the source of the pollution can be determined and addressed. In Griswold, the source of contamination was determined to be agriculture. But a solution proved elusive until area farmers were invited to help develop a strategy that would reduce the amount of nitrates entering the water supply. We was just trying to do it all ourselves and once we asked them it was like they come in and they, they were so much enthused about helping uh, protect our water, not only, not only the city's water but they're also, since we've started this, they've started doing it in other areas around Griswold that's not in the in our capture zone. The solution reached in Griswold was to plant cover crops in the identified capture zone. According to the Iowa Nutrient Reduction Strategy, 92% of nitrates in Iowa's waterways come from non-point sources, and cover crops are the best single farming practice to keep both soil and nitrates from running off farmland. The finding is the culmination of two years of work by the Iowa Department of Agriculture the Iowa Department of Natural Resources, and Iowa State University. We have some uh, land that lays around the city wells and we're doing a cover crop to try to control the nitrates in the water. Uh, the nitrates in the grizzled water have been moving up slowly and we're trying to, it's not dangerous levels yet, but we're trying to get ahead of it before they do. Cousins chose a cover crop of ryegrass, which was seeded by plain on standing corn. It is not the first conservation measure that he has adopted to protect Griswold's water supply. We put a buffer strip around here. It's a 200 foot radius around the well, probably oh, 15 years ago, something like that. I thought, thinking at that time that would help and it, it probably did help some, but now we're, we're putting uh, cover crops in to help, help uh, control the nitrates. And we've also gone to uh, spring applied anhydrous plus another split application where we're putting more liquid in. There are many solutions to the puzzle of how to protect municipal water supplies. Next week, we'll look at some of the alternative cover crops farmers are planting, as well as other conservation practices employed by rural communities to keep nitrates out of their water. For Market to Market, I'm Paul Yeager. According to the Iowa Department of Natural Resources, 30% of the 880 municipal water supplies in the state of Iowa are highly susceptible to contamination from nitrates. 
While there are many contributors, agriculture is often viewed as the primary source. We've seen some places in the country that, where the federal government has stepped in and try and, and regulate pieces around water quality with, with not a lot of success um, and certainly not near the size of an area we're talking about in the Mississippi River Basin or, or Iowa itself. In October of 2013, lawmakers in Iowa allocated an additional $22.4 million, doubling support to conservation and water quality improvements. $2.8 million was earmarked for a cost-sharing program designed to help farmers implement nutrient reduction strategies that include planting cover crops. We can do better. And if we focus on this, I think we'll get more tools and we'll figure out better ways of doing it. If that holds off the federal government from addressing this, I think this is a better, more effective way to make that happen, rather than have somebody thousands of miles in an office someplace draw a circle on a map and say, everybody does this in a certain area. We need that flexibility. We need, I think, the ingenuity of producers. The Iowa Nutrient Reduction Strategy, the culmination of two years of work by the Iowa Department of Agriculture, the Iowa Department of Natural Resources, and Iowa State University, found that cover crops were the best single practice farmers could implement to reduce pollution from nitrates. In Griswold, Iowa, it is hoped cover crops planted in the Wells Capture Zone will be the solution to reducing high nitrate levels in the city's water supply. We have family and friends that live in town, so we, we need to do what we can to protect the, the groundwater there also. And, and our wells come out of that too, so we need to, need to protect, protect what we drink also. Brent Beerbaum farms 2,500 acres of corn and soybeans near Griswold, Iowa. He planted rye grass as a cover crop after the harvest, but his neighbor Kenny Cousins applied seed to standing corn. We uh, flew uh, rye on September 3rd, and we got some nice rains after that, and we've got some good germination on the seed, and I think it's probably four or five inches tall out there now. While there are risks and costs involved with aerial seeding, there are benefits. Aerial seeding makes it possible to plant large areas quickly. It also extends the growing season because it allows the cover crop to be planted prior to harvesting the cash crop. If we get some fall rains, it, the stuff takes right off. The rye is an amazing little kernel that it'll turn itself around and put a root down just so easily. And uh, holding them nutrients uh, available uh, so they don't get away from the farmer should be a real plus for everybody involved. While Beerbaum and Cousins planted rye as a cover crop in Griswold, just down the road, Max Potter planted a combination of oats and turnips. The cover crop we got here is oats and turnips. We put it in where we chop. Uh, this is regularly, I guess, the first year we've done that. Uh, and with all the interest in cover crops right now, we thought we would try it. Oats as a cover crop deters weed growth, while turnips, described by some as cow candy, prevents soil compaction. When we get the rest of the corn harvested, as you can see behind me, we only chopped about half of this little field. And when we get the rest of the crop out, then we'll pasture the cows in here too. So it serves as a dual purpose. It uh, provides us with cow feed as well as, you know, uh, helping with erosion. And so the better we can take care of stuff and hold it here and uh, hopefully not get it into the water system, the better off everybody is. So it's not just for us, but it's, you know, the community and well, the country, I guess you'd say. Cover crops aren't the only cost-effective solution municipalities are employing to keep agricultural runoff from entering water supplies. In Elliott, Iowa, with a population of only 350 people, a $300,000 to $1 million nitrate removal facility was out of the question. The solution decided upon did not involve planting cover crops, but instead to take crop land out of production. And, you know, we talked to the committee, we voted on it, and this is what we decided, try to do it naturally and uh, have a wetland, and this will be more permanent, you know, on the outcome. The city purchased 18 acres of marginal farmland, and along with four acres donated by the school district, 
was able to construct a 22-acre wetland. While the primary goal of the wetland will be to filter nitrates out of the town's water supply, it will also be a gathering place for the community. Walking trails have been constructed and the wetland will be used by the school it borders as an outdoor classroom for environmental education. It is almost 100% funded by grants, so I mean, it's a, it's a very economical way to go and hopefully by next spring, everything will be done. While it is too early to assess a change in nitrate levels in Elliott, in Remsen, water monitoring tests have shown great results after the town of 1600 converted nearly 100 acres of cropland to native grasses. Becky Ortman is the Source Water Protection Coordinator for Iowa's Department right of now, Natural Resources. Um, we know that if you plant native grasses in an area that's highly susceptible, to anything on the surface as far as nitrate application or manure or anything like that. We know that native grasses work. Well, we can test them. Prior to planting native grasses, the city's water at wellhead number eight showed nitrate levels at nearly three times the 10 parts per million considered safe. Three years after seeding a 100 acre prairie, test results indicate nitrate levels have been reduced by 40% at wellhead eight and 30% overall. So for the community of Elliott, a wetland, that worked for them. For Griswold, cover crops work for them. For Rims in Iowa, putting in native grasses, converting cropland to native grasses work for them. So it's what we're trying to do is gather more of a suite of practices that will work in any community. For Market to Market, I'm Paul Yeager.